Good morning. Um, very excited to be here in this room. Uh, we have heard it's a very special room indeed. Um, I'm also excited to be here um, around so many creative uh, designers among, among uh, people with so much expertise in, in plastics as well. Um, and uh, I would like to share with you the journey that we have taken uh, with the new Plastics Economy Report, with the initiative that we have launched this summer, and then with our very new project, the C School, that I will uh, talk about with uh, Chris uh, from IDEO. So we have already seen uh, plastics are all around us. I mean, I really like this logo as well with all the, the items that we have. Um, plastics is everywhere. It has grown from almost nothing um, in the 60s to a 300 million ton uh, industry. Um, plastics is in so many applications available, so many forms, and in so many industries, and it brings enormous benefits. However, as you can see in, in this chart specifically, and as you see also um, in many pictures, it's also very linear. The system is um, a typical model of a take, make, and dispose um, model where you, you have very linear flows. And as you can see, the current rate of um, recycling is only 14%. Actually, most of that is downcycled, so only 2% go back into the material stream. Clearly there is a, a big opportunity and we see a new, uh, a new plastics economy as one of big opportunity to, to uh, create a more circular effective system. Um, we have outlined this in the, in the report that we have launched at the World Economic Forum. Um, and we have uh, fortunately seen uh, quite some interest in this concept and this idea of a more circular economy. Um, there have been hundreds, or actually, yeah, maybe more, uh, news articles uh, around the topic. Um, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, social media uh, responses, um, and it has also been picked up by um, companies, industry associations, and policymakers. But research and reports are not enough. We need we need action, and that's what the belief as well from our core partners in this report and from the philanthropic partners. And we saw a strong momentum behind the new plastics economy idea. And in May this, this year, we started an initiative, an ambitious initiative to mobilize change over the next three years. And that initiative builds on five pillars. It builds around the idea of a dialogue mechanism, which we have heard before is a very important element. We, we can't solve this systemic change. You have seen it's a very complicated system. Um, it includes designers, it includes um, business people, engineers, it includes different sections of the value chain from design to production to after use and nobody alone can address this. So we need, we need a dialogue mechanism across the whole system including various functions and various uh, mindsets as well. The second pillar of that is uh, innovation moonshots. We need innovation, we need these new technologies that we just have seen. We need new solutions, otherwise we can't overcome the current linear system. The system has been here for actually um, 40 years, 50 years, but, and we have, we have really worked hard on, on making it more circular. Um, but as we have seen, um, I think Bob mentioned it in, in, in the introduction, um, all the efforts, they haven't resulted in anything more than 2% of, of uh, actual recycling into the, into the same uh, loop. The third um, point is, of course, evidence, and we're going to continue to work on evidence base. Um, we will um, work on this also with, with our partners, uh, McKinsey and um, Plymouth Marine uh, Laboratory. And then there is a big topic also around um, a global plastics protocol. We need to have common standards in, in the industry to, to align towards common material formats or at least a common language. And one very exciting um, project that, that is uh, going on here is as well to ingrain more intelligence and information into packaging so that when we, when we are different stages in the value chain, that we know what is in the packaging, what we can do with it, uh, and what happens after use with it. And finally, it, it needs a lot of um, stakeholders to work together, so we do work with with policymakers, um, NGOs, and, and various players here. So, yeah. so, 
why, why do we believe that um, design is important? I, I think I was, I was completely nodding before when I heard that the design community is often not at the table when it comes to the debate. It's often, a, it's often around end of pipe. It's often around cleaning up when the problem was there. But actually, we have to solve the, the problem at the root. We have to think about what do we actually create? What do we, which system do we want to, to create? And I think we do face very demanding challenges, but these are also very exciting challenges. And just to mention one example, um, how, how, could we, how could we design out the need for the small, the small items, the separate lids, for example, in a bottle? When you look at the bottle, you do have small items that you detach when you drink, um, or the rings, um, and there is no, there is, I mean, there's good systems in place here, around here in London, in Western Europe, but not every country do ha does have the same system to, to collect, and there's a high leakage indeed. So evidence shows that these small detachable items actually leak um, most uh, in, into the sea, and the question is, can we do something similar to the Alucan? that we've done. Like the Alucan was in the past, we had a lid, when you open it, it comes away, right? And often it would leak. And then we have redesigned the, the Alucan such that the lid is not detachable anymore. It's a very simple uh, and, and simplified example, of course. Um, the, the challenge around plastic bottles is more complicated, but can we, can we be innovative and, and think of new solutions um, in, um, in, in the bottle example? This also applies to other items that leak very, very often, like sachets in developing countries. We see a trend towards more and more sachets being used. Sachets are like, you know, your small ketchup um, um, pouch that you use. Um, and they're very useful because they are um, making things in smaller portion sizes, but then also there's, they typically leak. Uh, can, we, can we rethink the way we, we deliver the content of the product to the, to the people, to the user? Can we redesign that? And more broadly, like, can we rethink how we use our product as a circular service? Can we think about the reusability? Can we, can we think about how do we get our content from A to B? Uh, how can that be more circular? So we do have these questions. We have many more questions um, that we encounter during our research. And at the moment, there are just no good tools or answers that would help us. So we see a strong vision, we see the what and the why of the new plastics economy, of, the, of a circular plastics economy, but the how is something that is missing today, largely. We, 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 of course, we see many good tools on the technical level, but often they are quite isolated for, for one specific area, and they're not really on a, on a, on a level that would help us to, to overcome these challenges that we face here. And also in our discussions with um, educators in the university side, um, we see that there is, at the moment, circular design is, is not part of many uh, design curricula. And the fact that this is like the only, the only session that is around this topic, as Doug has mentioned before, is also very symbolic for the, the fact that there, there needs to be more on the how, how to design for a circular economy. That was the reason why we, together with IDEO, built on the idea of a C-School, a circularity school, and we are very um, happy and excited to work with IDEO, one of the most uh, innovative uh, design consultancies in the field. Um, we see two things coming together. We see the circular and system perspective, and then we see on the other side the design thinking process that has been shaped by IDEO, and we want to merge these two to build something that's called the C-School. We are just a humble disclaimer at this point, especially given that there's so many experienced designers and experienced um, um, plastics um, designers in uh, particular are here. We are in week three. So the, it's gonna be a long journey, um, but I think it's, it's a very exciting journey. The C-School, the C-School is intends to inspire and to build capabilities amongst designers for the, designing for the new plastics economy and for the circular economy more broadly. So we think that this is, the plastics industry is a very challenging one. It's uh, one of the most linear ones. But we think that the toolkit will also be helpful for people beyond um, the, the plastics economy. 
it will be um, it will be tools and methodologies that you can apply. So it will be more practice than theory, and it will also help with something called the Moonshot program. That was very quickly what I introduced before. It's one of the program areas of the New Plastics Economy. So we'll launch later um, this year, actually early next year, innovation moonshots. These are big projects that should overcome some of the demanding um, design challenges. And it will help the people participate in, in those moonshots. And in the long term, we want to create a new generation of um, capable designers for the circular economy, something that um, will equip them on, on the path. So a draft uh, of how this will look like. It will be publicly available. Everybody can access it. It will be very modular and accessible to different levels. So we are aware that there's different starting levels when it comes to circular design, and it will, um, it will tailor for that. It will be in various forms, um, for example, videos, inspiring uh, case studies, but also tools that you can really apply, so workshops and, and, and uh, printable tools. Chris, I think, will talk a bit more about uh, the principles, process, and methods that we, that we are developing as part of C-School. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Good. In the spirit of bringing together different people to solve this complex challenge, we believe that this is not a project that we can do in isolation. So we're working with uh, various um, designers from both university side, but also from the corporate side. Of course, we build on the network that we have in the New Plastics Economy Initiative, which, uh, um, based on the report, included around 40 companies from the plastics industry, from the whole value chain. Um, but also from, from outside of the New Plastics Economy Initiative, we, we work with people um, to, to test and prototype this uh, toolkit. And we do have an advisory board of, of experts in, in both circular um, uh, design as well as um, design thinking. And as I mentioned before, this is the start of a very long and, and um, exciting journey. So we're at the very beginning now. And I wanted to share with you what the, the next milestones are and how you can also be part of this. So you see that mid of October, we will have our first prototype. It's going to be a beta version. Um, and we'll test that and further refine it in the spirit of a design thinking process, which is very iterative. We'll have an innovation workshop in New York with um, the New Plastics Economy uh, Initiative uh, participants. And then I would like to, to invite you to our um, DIFF session, Disruptive Innovation Festival session on the 8th of November. Uh, Joe Iles is going to talk a bit more about the DIFF in general. We will have one session on C-School where we will be able to share more about what we have developed. So as, as we are still in the process, uh, that will be the, the, um, the first time when we can really give you some, some meat on the bone. And then it will be available next year. Um, in 2017. This, uh, this is uh, the, the point where I would like to, to give the word to, to Chris. Um, as I've mentioned before, we are very excited to work with IDEO. Uh, Chris is the um, Circle Economy Portfolio Manager at IDEO. And um, yeah, we'll walk us through the second part of this. Thanks, Simon. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Very exciting to be at this event. Um, and uh, thanks, Doug, for inviting, inviting us along. Uh, so uh, we're only in week three of designing this uh, toolkit. So um, I, and it's kind of, uh, I, don't, I will do not pretend to have uh, many uh, answers, if, if, if any. And uh, we're really just in a process of starting to ask some questions about uh, what it's going to take to um, uh, scale uh, the the role of design and uh, the the, uh, the the movement towards the circular economy. Um, so um, yeah, I do have this sort of strange feeling of, of of kind of building the plane as we're going down the runway, kind of at the moment. Um, so I think you know we're, we're um, I'm going to share some of the, kind of the high level principles we're exploring. Uh, and I guess you, you might be thinking sort of why a design why a design thinking toolkit? Why can't you just sort of tell us what to design? Um, and uh, th that's a question we hear quite a lot from designers. And, um, and actually, that's, that's kind of a relevant uh, kind of context to um, 
I guess you know what we what we saw is the needs we were trying to cater for, uh, it, almost if you like the gap we were trying to sort of fill with this toolkit. And I think uh, you know what, what what perhaps is obvious, but might be worth just sort of stating is that you know designing for systems change is is, is a sort of non-traditional design task in many ways in terms of how uh, many organisations and many designers are sort of set up. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's by its nature more sort of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. Uh, it involves traditional designers operating in non-traditional ways in, in that sense. Um, although many of you, are, I'm sure, now being trained to think more systemically, uh, more about, for example, business models and that kind of thing, if you're a traditional, let's say, engineer or perhaps product designer. But it also is a process that's going to involve... Um, it's going to involve uh, many non-traditional designers, so de designers with a, with a small, a small D, if you like, um, those perhaps who are currently uh, are working in on, on kind of design or, or, or circular economy MBAs, uh, and so you know designers with a small D. That's why we need to design think. That's one reason why why design thinking as a process is very sort of helpful because it's very accessible. It's not it's not uh, predicated on having sort of deep technical expertise in any one field of design. But it is a good, it's an interesting process for systems change. Um, so there are many technical tools out there for um, for designing for circularity, and, and and actually talking to some of the people who've developed those tools, you know, it's their sort of uh, it's their technical kind of qualities, um, which actually sometimes are, are a barrier. It's it's their it's their complexity. They're not particularly human centred to to use, and that's something that as desi as as um, education designers at IDEA, we're, we're very interested in. That, that human centeredness of, of the tools and of the, of the, of the learning experience. So there really, the really aren't, that, the, it really struck us that there really aren't that many tools out there focused on the learning you need for the for circular economy design, the kind of the mindsets, uh, uh, the, the, the methods, um, uh, in, in a sort of, in a, in a truly sort of, uh, potentially scalable way. Um, so this was the scalable learning, what is the scalable learning for the circular economy? Um, and uh, you know, we really needed to help a lot of people. If we were going to do this at scale, it's really this journey of, of course, getting to circularity is a, is a journey of becoming more circular. So how could we uh, perhaps you know, not necessarily beat ourselves up with kind of, uh, you know, what, what, um, what people were able to achieve as a first step? And also um, you know, address, address, actually, to some extent, how circular economy is changing design. Um, and that's, uh, that was touched on a little bit in, in Vim's talk, and, uh, which was, I thought, very, very, very interesting in terms of, for example, uh, uh, areas such as sort of embedding intelligence in what we design, and design not really having a sort of traditional beginning and end anymore is, is kind of very, very interesting. Um, and how do we approach um, systems change as a creative challenge? This is not an analytical challenge. Well, it, it, it's partly an analytical challenge. You have to sort of know what's going on. But it's also a creative challenge. This is a, a challenge as much about value creation, for example, as it is about anything else, because that's obviously part of the, the theory of change here, if we're going to do it at scale and with businesses, which is, which is ultimately uh, very much uh, the, the heart of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's uh, theory of change. So how do we leverage design? How do we leverage business? So, um, so design thinking um, offers a, uh, a kind of a, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate I might be preaching to, to the converted or people who know a lot about this, but just briefly for those who, who, who don't, design thinking is quite a creative and pragmatic approach to system change. It, it looks, uh, it's fundamentally, it's an approach for innovation. So, um, in that sense, it's, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a creative process. Um, it has some values behind it, which are, I think, interesting for systems change as well, that I'll come on to talk about in a second. Um, it, it's also a process that is pragmatic, as I mentioned, because it starts to, it, it believes in starting small to build momentum and confidence and, and examples of success. Um, so we're not about, in, if we're using, you know, the, take the design thinking sort of mindset, we're not about waiting for a silver bullet. We're about kind of getting out there, learning by doing, and moving in the right direction. But we're trying to balance that idea of sort of, you know, the, you know we're trying to avoid the risk of just doing small things, because obviously we don't need that. Uh, you know, we're trying, to, we're trying to balance the sort of the, the, the necessity to start, to start going in a direction, uh, with this idea that if, we, if we're working iteratively, uh, you know, we can, um, we can get better, this is where it gets a little bit circular, we can get better at what we do every time we go through that, that learning loop. Um, and that's obviously the, the, the point around how we can get better and stronger uh, and kind of build, um, 
build more circularity um, through sort of these circular aspects of, of, of the, uh, the learning kind of approach that is, is, is design, design thinking. So it's trying to say, look, let's get going. Uh, let's not wait for a silver bullet, but let's, let's look at things which we can build to be catalytic and build to be um, you know, systems, systems changing. Uh, and, and let's learn how to do that and get stronger in doing that by actually doing stuff. So it's a circular thing. So um, I think really uh, kind of underpinning, um, you know, I think behind design thinking are some key values which are quite useful just to sort of remind ourselves about. There, there are design values at IDEO. Uh, they're useful to remind ourselves about because they are sort of in the context of our thinking around what this toolkit uh, ultimately should kind of uh, how it should inspire people. So, I mean, being optimistic sounds like it's really sort of overly simplistic, and especially in, in a sort of maybe in a form, formal forum, you know, you can think, oh, what this, that sounds a bit weird. But, um, you know, we have to believe, you know, so actions, actions follow intent. You know, we have to, I think we're all here because we believe that change is possible. Uh, but not everyone that does, of course, out there. And so, you know, when you're, when you're going through a process of sort of systems change, you know, within your organization, within, within an industry, it's, 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 it's not, a, not necessarily a very immediately rewarding process. You have to believe, uh, you have to be a certain sort of, have a high sort of pain threshold. Um, you know, you have to, uh, but also, you, you know, more to the point with this value, optimism, you have to have an open mind. You know, this is a, a divergent uh, process, really, um, in, in, in a way at the beginning, anyway. And, you know, which helps, and you know, being optimistic helps us be more, more, more generative and, and, and divergent in our thinking about what might be possible. So it maybe sounds like a sort of, I don't know, a bit overly simplistic, almost childlike. But that's, I guess, the point here is that. Uh, uh, mindset is actually fundamentally important, and our ability to sort of share enthusiasm and, and be infectious is actually um, part of part of the the, the process of change. Um, and so, embracing ambiguity, um, and these values all link on on some level. But uh, you know, it, it, this is of course big in systems change because. Um, you know, you, you, you quite quickly get into the fog, uh, particularly in, 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 in plastics, which I think is perhaps, you know, perhaps the most, it's certainly the most challenging and complex systems change challenge for the circular economy in terms of a sector that, that I've, I've seen uh, uh, so far. And um, I think, you know, because it involves so many, so many, uh, 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 so much collaboration, so many moving parts, as Simon, Simon alluded to. But embracing ambiguity as part of the, the, pro the design process is, is really key, and it's, gonna, it's definitely going to be a, va a useful uh, a concept for designers uh, designing in the circular economy. And, you know, you, the, the ability to keep going in the fog, just keep, kind of keep going and believing you're going get to get to the other side is, 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 is uh, really, really uh, important as, as well. Um, so, um, I, I, like, I love this quote, to sort of put that in context from, and it, what would be a talk about circular economy without a quote from Buckminster Fuller? But, you know, so he said, there is nothing in a caterpillar that tells you it's going to be uh, a butterfly. So that's what I like to sort of think about. Um, so, collaboration, I mean, obviously, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to create uh, diversity in, in, in the inputs here uh, in terms of a, a design approach. Uh, we're, we're thinking in an interdisciplinary way. We're, of course, trying to think across silos in our industry and in our organisation. And that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of mindset, uh, kind of approach, um, is, is going to be useful for designing across systems, designing systems approaches, designing for something that's more implementable uh, you know, uh, within, within a business and a value chain. So I think that's, that's perhaps an obvious point. Um, and then, of course, learning from failure. So this goes back to the, the iteration point. You know, so we, we, we will say, I, IDEO, uh, we, we try to fail fast to succeed sooner. Uh, and and, and you know, so you should sort of say to yourself, well, maybe if I'm not, if I'm not failing, you know, maybe the point is to convince your business that if you aren't, if you aren't trying and failing around this stuff, you aren't sort of trying hard enough. And if you can, if you can dangle the, the value, as Vim was talking about, uh, that could potentially be attained for your business, then, then it's worth kind of trying it. And I'll come back to that. So trial and error, learn by doing, is, is going to be a kind of a key to that iterative approach. Um, I'm conscious of time. I know we're running a little bit behind today. So I'm just going to sort of skip, skip, skip on and uh, talk very quickly about a couple of these values. Um, talk less, do more. So I mentioned already it's through designing and trying stuff that uh, the strategy will come, actually. We believe uh, at IDEA that design and strategy are a sort of continuous loop and uh, uh, just, uh, you know, we, the amount of business is not just in the circular economy, but uh, business is facing sort of constant, constant disruption and that are sort of 
gearing up really for a state of, of, of just kind of owning, being in, 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 in a continuous state of kind of flux, then uh, th this, this is very much the kind of part of what the, the mindset is today of, of, of you know, we will, we will try stuff, we will do stuff, we will develop our strategy as we go. And I think the uh, former CEO of Southwest Airlines famously said, um, you know, uh, when asked if, we, if they have a strategic plan, he said, yes, it's called doing stuff. And I think that's, that's, that's kind of the, 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 the mode here, is build to think. Uh, mom momentum is everything and it's infectious. Um, and, of course, make others successful. So where you see the, 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 the collective potential of, uh, for, for the collective value and, and potential of change in a system trumps the kind of lone actor, that's obviously key. So sort of brush up on your, your empathy skills. You know, where collective change is, is, a, is, is, is a game of kind of growing the pie, uh, that this, this is obviously kind of uh, uh, key. Uh, where there are, for example, uh, you know, cost savings if you can all make this happen. You know, some of the figures at the MacArthur Foundation you know, uh, uh, have the amazing, the amazing value that can be released uh, in plastics alone if we become more circular really does depend on, on, on of course, that incredible amount of collaboration. Um, so, you know, where you rely on others, uh, think about that point of, I can never say this, uh, reciprocity um, and, uh, and, and, and how you, you kind of build uh, incentives and benefits for everybody in, in the value chain is, is, is going to be key. So, um, I, that's, so that's enough of just sort of the design values and I think where, they, where they're relevant to the, the process of systems change or the design thinking kind of values that we have at IDEO. I, you know, we, we are, as I said, in week three of this, um, you know, C-Schools is perhaps a slightly deceptive title, but it's, it's this idea that we have that we're building this kind of body of sort of knowledge and capabilities. But it's, it, it's the first thing we're doing is this toolkit um, and, uh, you know, it will have these, these kind of three components. Um, we're in week, week three. We've been very much kind of focused on, uh, um, on, on the kind of principles. So that's where the, the emerging principles and the questions we want to ask at that level. Um, so that's what I'm going to sort of touch on uh, briefly. But we've, we're, we're developing the, the processes and the methods to support that as well. So, I mean, I think um, the first one is, is around kind of um, uh, breaking linearity in, 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 and imagining kind of circular flow. So, Orientation and mapping are going to be key sort of start points. We know that. Um, so thinking about uh, you know where you fit in the system, what your what your current kind of linear you know category map uh, looks like, uh, what it could look like if you started to imagine closing some of those uh, some of those loops, both in terms of uh, you know what would ha what would your what would your industry, what would your value chain look like if you close loops uh, at a sort of industry-wide level, perhaps in terms of uh, creating, um, you know, industry-wide sort of feedstocks that were recycled, or maybe at, a, at more at an outer loop level in terms of the ability of, uh, of, the, of the materials you're using to go back into the uh, into, into natural cycles, into, into natural systems, or maybe right in the, those inner loops in terms of, you know, can we create any any kind of closed loops here um, between ourselves and, and, our, and, our, and our customers and our users. Um, in a, more, in a more direct way uh, in terms of material kind of take back. And, um, so those are some of the sort of things we want people, we, we're, we're thinking that, you know, it's a useful start point in terms of orientation and kind of mapping. Um, and, um, you know, what these systems require, you know, the questions we, we want designers to be asking is what would these systems that we've just mapped out, circular systems require that doesn't currently exist in terms of actors in the system, maybe we don't have uh, people providing the various functions that this circular system uh, would require, uh, maybe that, you know, we don't have, uh, we, we maybe have the right actors but they're in the wrong roles, uh, what kind of level of collaboration uh, would we need to make this actually kind of happen, um, particularly important in, in, in plastics. Uh, and what are, what are you know, uh, your own uh, what are your own kind of dependencies in the system that are going to be kind of challenged uh, and that also of the kind of um, the value chain? So how does it fundamentally challenge how you might make money? So that's the kind of orientation and kind of mapping. What challenges do, and what, 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 what does circularity look like potentially? What could it look like and what challenges does it kind of pose? And then I think there's a point around rethinking uh, viability. And so this is really, you know, as I said at the beginning, we're trying to create something that's very, very business-centric because that's key to the sort of theory of change that we have. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we really kind of root the early thinking in what are the new business benefits 
uh, that, that what new incentives could this potentially offer us and our, and our value chain, both in terms of maybe a bit less likely in plastics, but moving from, well, I, know, I don't know, actually, maybe, maybe I didn't really sort of mean that. There are certain, certainly some examples of this, but moving from kind of product to service models, maybe if I'm in a direct-to-consumer business, uh, and I have that distribution channel direct to consumers, I could think about that, or in a B2B sense around kind of pallets and things like that. So what, how, could I t how can I move from kind of product to sort of service model? Um, and what are the saving on material costs we could make if we're using, uh, if we're using kind of uh, recycled uh, 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 materials? Um, in a case, challenging when the oil price has gone, has gone down, but in the end, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, um, a, you know, a strategic risk uh, that we need to address. You know what are what are the what are the benefits of avoiding uh, kind of uh, you know reg regulations that are coming down the track and getting set up to avoid them? Uh, what are the what are the brand perception benefits? You know, um, I think increasingly, um, you know, in, FM, in FMCG, for example, you know, there will be if you're selling a natural product, if in the end, you know, it doesn't it doesn't support you know natural systems, uh, and, and I think the you know consumers might be increasingly aware of they're just a sort of waste you know if they're just a waste dump at the end of a linear a linear line of production, then uh, if, if stuff's just sort of dumped on them, then, then they, they may not feel, um, if they feel responsible at the end of a line, it may not, may not be such a great thing for the brand. So thinking about the fit of natural products and natural systems, I think is an interesting area for, for FMCG gonna, going forward. And, and if, we, if we do manage to grow the pie, so in, you know, in plastics, if we can create enough scale around you know, recycled materials, uh, by looking at things like standardization and, and, and kind of the, 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 the tracking of what materials are where, the, those kinds of things that the moonshot areas that the foundation is looking at. If we, if, we can, if we can potentially kind of grow the pie in, in, at a system-wide level in terms of um, get some economies of scale, then that could, be, um, that could be something that we need to work, therefore, with others to achieve. But looking at viability in different ways, in terms of business viability, how we make money out of this stuff or, or save money, um, and... Um, and putting that right at the front of the, of the design process. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, there's some, this again is an emerging area, but there's something the foundation are really, really looking at is, is uh, and I think the world is beginning to look at, is how we frame this, this topic, this narrative. So, so, so important. Um, you know, we know that, um, you know, obviously we know, we're all well, 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 well aware of the sort of, what were the, some of the challenges around sus the sustainability narrative is seen as anti-business, anti-growth, all that stuff. So really looking here, what are the frames that can put this right at the heart of the innovation agenda in companies, rather than it being just a, a kind of thing you do on the fringes because you have to or because you know, you're, you're a good person or whatever it is. Um, and so really um, you know, thinking about sort of circularity perhaps in terms of, you know, we've already mentioned some examples in Vim's talk around IoT. You know, if, you know, circularity will probably happen at some level anyway through the evolution of Internet of Things, and we're just trying to kind of accelerate that and, 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 and steer it to an extent. So, you know, framing around information systems, future of, 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 of kind of data and that kind of thing is, I think, is, is, is a sensible place to look. Um, because it avoids perhaps some of the, the, the negative framing that can come out of maybe just talking all the time around, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, using sort of biological metaphors and talking about maybe metabolisms versus, you know, um, yeah, you know versus a kind of uh, mechanistic linear economy. That's all very well. That's maybe the, what we need to end up in, in more of a metabolism. But maybe that language isn't helpful. Uh, uh, maybe maybe talking more about information systems, for example, might be better. Might be better language. But that's an area we're we're, ex we're exploring. Um, so I think the other the other area is kind of designing for adaptability, um, and again we had some great examples with this earlier earlier in the previous talk. So thinking about things like kind of modularity, but also and this is where I think it's, circular economy poses some interesting questions for what design is a process and as a thing you do actually is anymore uh, you know so designing in designing in intelligence um, and, and embedded intelligence. So I think. Um, you know, obviously, if we're if, if if we're thinking of growing the pie, creating a a, a bigger pot of of, of uh, recycled material as a feedstock, you know, we need to be thinking of the things that Simon and the Foundation are looking at in terms of moonshots, standardisation, ability to sort of uh, you know track better what's kind of going into the system, all that all that kind of thing. Um, so thinking about the sort of the, the 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 adaptability of what you're you're designing to fit with the larger system uh, is obviously kind of key. Um, 
thinking about maybe user re, um, reusability for the user. But as I also mentioned, this embedded intelligence piece. So, you know, what's, what's, and, ha and how can that um, drive uh, value creation? So, thinking about not just that at a system wide level in terms of growing, uh, you know, growing the sort of um, the recycled feedstock, for example, but in terms of maybe closed loop systems with users and this idea of kind of personalization. So, design very much in the, in, you know, in the future will be about designing as much. The, 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 the data flows, the material flows that your material and product is going to be part of and not the individual products in a sort of A to Z kind of linear kind of design process. So it's going to be more of a continuous process of, of, um, of, 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 of you know, I suppose, understanding whether circularity is, is kind of really kind of how it's working uh, through, the, through the kind of data feedbacks that you're getting and continuously kind of working in that cycle to improve it and to improve the money you can make out of it. So that's, I think, the future we're moving, moving to where design becomes, it, design itself becomes a much less kind of linear process and the things we're designing are as much data flows as they are anything else, which poses some big challenges for a company like, uh, uh, well, I mean, IDEO is kind of move, move, moving uh, towards that in terms of the design capabilities we have, we have but it's pretty disruptive. Um, so, um, so I think that's, that's kind of in terms of uh, the, the kind of point around sort of what we're designing for this kind of highest level of material utility and how we're designing. And then, um, you know, also looking at uh, kind of nurturing the, the ecosystem, we've, we've touched on this a, a bit, but obviously making sure the incentives and benefits are in place uh, for the value chain is, is really uh, a key to ensure, you know, circular system fitness and, and, and resilience at multiple scales, whether that's within your company uh, or, or, or within, within the industry. You know, so how, you know, what are the benefits and incentives that need to be sort of within your company? What, do, what does your company, your organisation need to see? What, what incentives need to be in place? Um, and then, you know, I think this is the, the point around, and, and this is where it becomes a little bit indistinguishable between the material you're designing to be smart and the kind of uh, feedback loops you need to prove success uh, and build momentum. But this is, this is going to be key. So starting small and building feedback loops. Uh, feedback loops, we obviously under, understand, are important to sort of circular systems. So this is about um, creating momentum. It's about you know, you being able to work at a scale that is tackleable and manageable, uh, so creating small measurable experiments that build evidence and test assumptions, and, and kind of building those feedback loops at, at scale that, so that you can start to kind of uh, demonstrate, um, demonstrate the value of what you're doing uh, and, and build the kind of the system, the, the circular system sort of fitness and, and resilience. Um, and that kind of, as I said, you know, I think is very much the future of design, where you're, the, the idea of designing something and then testing assumptions about it kind of becomes indistinguishable from this process of, of kind of managing materials with a con continuous adjustment, I think, in, in, in the future. So I think that's where we're heading. But I think this becomes an important point about how you build momentum in your business, is that idea of starting small and building the feedback loops that can prove your hypothesis. So those are, those are, um, those are some of the areas that we've been kind of, uh, I suppose, starting to ask kind of questions around of what could these how could we enable people in these, how can we enable designers with a small d in these areas and working with the foundation and all their expertise in, in education as well and the circular economy, we're sort of trying to bring that together with design thinking and create a, a, create a toolkit in its very early days. So that's, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's it. Oh yeah, how, to, how you can get involved, sorry. Um, so um, as I said, we'll, we'll be kind of, at, towards the end of the year, this will be sort of publicly kind of released. We're going through a big testing phase from mid-October um, and um, there'll be sort of, there'll be uh, communications kind of issued uh, around, uh, around the kind of the launch and, and ways to stay connected and, and provide us with feedback if that's something you're prepared to, to do once we launch it. So uh, I think we've got time maybe for a couple of quick questions. I don't, I don't know, Doug, and then uh, Joe is going to talk about the Disruptive Innovation Festival. Simon, right here. You, oh, you got a microphone. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll stay with Simon and... Uh, yeah, let's start on the side. Uh, I have a question for both of you, actually. It's a great presentation. Uh, my name is Bremley. I'm actually working with Doug. I'm from uh, Worldview Impact Foundation. And we've been testing out the Global Alert, uh, you know, app, if you know about it, to engage young people, students, schools, and universities, because I think that is key, what you're developing, to engage and educate young people. It's great to design, but if people are not educated and linked to educators from the designers from how to use that tool, like the, the, like the, 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 the tea, the kettle, using how much water. So the, the, my question is, how do you create a paradigm shift for all the consumers 
to engage in how you use your product in a sustainable way and not harming or wasting energy or harming the environment in the long run and fitting that into your toolkit design because at the end of the day it's about uh, addressing uh, the consumption and production patterns, engaging the mass, uh, a, a label in every product, like if a young person buys, he or she can see how much impact does this product have, cradle to cradle, on the planet and the future generations, and what role do I carry when I, I mean, buy this product? I, I think, it, I think it's, a, it's a very good point that you make. I think it needs efforts from different angles. I think it needs different, um, different uh, organizations working on different parts of the puzzle. Um, complementing each other, I think, and I think the um, the C school in particular will um, well, it will not be just tools, right? Like that stand there, and that it's really hard to kind of like understand them. It's more also of an introduction to a new way of thinking. I think the mindset that Chris conveyed very nicely in the in the principles is the start of this. But I also understand it's like it needs more, right? It needs also like a whole kind of like change in the education system, and the foundation does have. Um, one area, I mean, there is an education team and we do have like efforts there as well. Uh, but the, of course it also needs more in the area of like uh, civic engagement and so on. Um, I think the foundation, we are, we are expanding quickly, are like, growing and trying to, to tackle these points. But at the same time, um, I think everybody has, has slightly different um, capabilities and starting points. Uh, so I think what we should do is um, not reinvent the wheel, but rather complement each other. And I think, I, I must say, I have to look a bit deeper into what you're doing, but um, it, it sounds great like in, in terms of like the building this awareness yeah, of what you actually, what your role is within the whole system. That's, that's my personal take on it.